Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chandra Alexander, and I am the Vice President of Development at Global Fund for Women. We are delighted that you've taken some time out of your busy schedule to join us for our inaugural call, Voices of Equality, a webinar series dedicated to helping us all come together to better understand and activate around issues affecting women and girls globally. So thank you all again for joining us. Again, this is our inaugural Voices of Equality webinar. Today we'll be discussing and engaging around the question, what do the sustainable development goals mean for women and girls? In this monthly series of one-hour calls, it's our pleasure to share with you our investors and ambassadors for gender equality, the latest thinking, inspirations, and on-the-ground work in the women's human rights sector. I'd like to begin with a quick introduction to our speaker today, Dr. Masimbi Kanyaro, the President and CEO of Global Fund for Women. Dr. Kanyaro is an activist and academic with decades of experience with decades of experience running international NGOs, non-governmental organizations. She is an internationally recognized leader for women's human rights. And I am proud, we are proud, to have her as our president and CEO. Dr. Kanyoro, I'd like to turn this call over to you now and invite your reflections on the SDGs. Thank you very much, Chandra, for that introduction. And I want to thank you so much for those of you that are calling in on our first Voices of Equality webinar. We're really happy to kick this up during this new year. I want to thank you for your partnership and I hope that in our talking together and learning together today, at the end we will leave you encouraged and ready to collaborate with the Global Fund for year 2016. So let me begin by saying our topic today, what are sustainable development goals? really begins by acknowledging that 2015 was a historic year in global cooperation. The UN adopted the Sustainable Development Goals in September, and then in December, this was also followed by an adoption of a landmark agreement on climate change. These are really huge, huge, testaments to global power of cooperation, especially now in a time when globally we face many challenges, challenges such as refugee populations moving on, conflicts, violence, extremism, as like we had today of what happened in, in Pakistan today, persistent inequalities, etc. These large, wicked problems require collaboration because they exceed what anyone can do in one border. So then, what are these sustainable development goals? Oh, can you remove that sound? Okay. Uh, come with me, travel with me to the year 2030 and imagine, is that, what is that? For those of you who are not able to mute yourselves through the webinar, can you please press pound six or hit the mute button on your iPhone to kindly mute your phone? Thank you, thank you. So, once again, what are sustainable development goals? What I intend to do today is discuss about what sustainable development goals are, what they mean for women and girls, and what we at the Global Fund are doing about them. So let's begin with what are sustainable development goals. Um, so I want you to travel with me and imagine the year 2030 and, uh, uh, and, and, th and think of a world what kind of world would you want to see in the year 2030? This is exactly what many nations 
and many peoples of the world spent the year 2015 and even before that trying to imagine what the year 2030 would look like and how they can contribute towards things that make that time a better time for the whole world and for the generations to come. And so they came up with the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a new global, new global goals that are, have got 17 goals with indicators, 169 indicators that are measurable. And 193 nations came together in September of this year, of last year, and on the 25th of September, they adapted these goals. These goals cover a wide range of things. They cover subjects such as ending poverty, for example, in goal number one, or goal number three, ensuring healthy lives or healthy communities, or goal number five, achieving gender equality, or goal number 16, to promote peace in the world. So they, they cover a large agenda, and if only this agenda could be fulfilled by half, by 2030, the world would be a world where there is more parity in economies, in social systems, in gender systems, and where, for example, businesses would have practices which do not exploit the resources that they have, but rather they would be able to look after the resources uh, that they have in a better way. Children graduating out of school will look forward to having jo jobs and girls, girls and boys would have equal access and enrollment in primary school and in secondary school, etc. So these are some of the outcomes that we expect in the Sustainable Development Goals, in the 17 Sustainable, sustainable Development Goals. When we listen to them, we might ask, do they sound like utopia? Are they too ambitious or even too romantic? How do you bring poverty agenda and environmental agenda together without pitting them against each other? Can the North and the South, developing countries and developed world, be measured with the same standards? These questions were part of the process. Nations, civil society, businesses, and other people really struggled to try to answer these questions and also to know that these are realities upon which they will have to mitigate the way to go forward. So the process did not leave these questions behind, but rather there was a lot of discussion that took place, the North and the South, developing countries discussing with the developed countries, researchers, exploring what inequities mean within even a country or between people. And the civil society participated very strongly in the agenda to set up the Sustainable Development Goals. I was part of the civil society that participated. I played a role in being a member of the task force, the United Nations Task Force on Reproductive Health a high-level task force, and our intention was to really look at the area of sexual reproductive health and rights and say what can nations do together to keep this alive in the Sustainable Development Goals. But more than that, we at the Global Fund were really proud at the participation of the major group. Uh, the major group was a civil society organized group by, by women activists like ourselves using very strong feminist participation to ask questions and to really extend the discussion, pushing and providing data in such a way that the role of women and the research that is available to support what is needed to make a change with the participation of women would become a possibility. A member of our board from Kyrgyzstan, Nurgul, was a member of this major group and we depended a lot on the advocacy that they did for us to, to continue to define a future of participating as the Global Fund, which I will tell you about in a little while. So we followed it. We were part of the discussion. 
and on the actual day of the adaptation of these sustainable development goals, a number of us also participated in the meeting and listened to various presentations by heads of states and even the Pope, as you may remember, addressed the General Assembly. Shortly after the adoption on the 26th of September, a historic event took place in, um, uh, in Central Park where more than 60,000 people gathered from every part of life, from activists such as Malala, a woman that you may remember, a girl that was shot for wanting to have an education, to business people such as Branson, who was recently uh, sent even um, uh, a plane to, 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 to the moon to the United Nations Secretary General and others participated. But what I remember from being present at this event, not a single head of state or civil society leader or business leader gave a presentation without mentioning the role of women. So the role of women was center. The role of women was in every speech of the 150 world leaders who gathered at the UN on September 25th and those who spoke at the celebration to popularize the sustainable development goals. And that's where I come in to say, so what do they mean to women and girls in the world? What do sustainable development mean to women and, and, and girls in the world? To be able to discuss that, I think I need to put you back a little bit on why was it possible for us to be able to have a stand alone sustainable development goal on gender equality. First of all, there was research and data that had been done for many, many years that showed that the Millennium Development Goals fall short of going to the root causes because they did not involve women sufficiently other researches that had been done by OECD, by the World Bank, by universities, again and again pointed out the involvement of women is key to achieving greater results and to achieving significant results in every area. And even when compared to countries that involved women in whatever they were doing, there was always higher progress for those countries that involved women uh, than those countries that had barriers to women's involvement. So research provided a big deal in uh, deciding to have a gender equality. Secondly, activism of women was very important. Activism of women supported by women monitoring budgets and activities that had happened before really played a key role. For us in the women's movement, research that was done, for example, by AWID was really important to show that unless women are well-funded, they would not be able to participate in fulfilling sustainable development goals. For those of you who are on your phone, just a quick reminder to please press star six or mute your iPhone so that we don't get background noise on the call. Thank you. So using data was really important and it has taught us as we go into the future why that is going to continue to be very important. So for the women and girls today, we have an opportunity. And that opportunity is uh, enabled by various things. One is availability of data that provides many, many ways of uh, uh, interpreting what women's participation would look like. For example, advancing women's equality can add 12 trillion to global growth. This is coming out of a McKinsey study and is available to many people. And so we can see that there is opportunity. There are data that shows that if we closed gender gap in agriculture, we would lift up to 
100 or 150 million people out of hunger and poverty. Lifting people out of poverty is, sustain, uh, hung, is, is sustainable development goal number one, and hunger is sustainable development goal number two. Or an, another example would be that technical, t technology companies which have got parity of women actually usually do better. These are all opportunities that help us to see that for women and girls today, they are more than just the women activists or women's movements that are talking about um, uh, women. It's a ripe time for us. It's an opportunity for us to be able to ride in this wave of knowledge about the importance that women can play. And they are actually joining the voice of, voices of women activists that have been saying these things over and again for many years. There are also areas where we see now for women and girls really new changes. For example, we begin to hear investments, some of them coming from individuals. Recently here in the Silicon Valley where we are based, we had uh, um, an announcement of uh, Zuckerberg and, uh, um, from Facebook and uh, Sh uh, Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook giving some of their resources to support the work of women and girls. We've had reason in a few years back, we had the investment that has been made in family planning by Melinda Gates, for example. These are signs showing opportunities that new investments are coming for women and it's really a good time to be working to actually ensure that these investments are well used and go to the right places where women will be able to benefit from them. Another reason why um, um, it's really important for women and girls present here is that the voices of women and girls themselves are loud and clear from every part of the world. A study done over 40 years by universities showed that women activists, and especially those using the feminism as a frame, kept the question of violence against women on the agenda. And this, it is their voices that made a difference, not even the policies. It is the persistent voices of women activists who know what is right for them. Now, this is an opportunity for women and girls today because they can be able to coordinate both what is needed to bring the change as well as the resources that might be available from governments or from the private sector or from individuals to actually move the agenda that they care for. This is really important time for women and girls because it's a time when women and girls will actually also be able to pinpoint that while we know that the social and economic goods are important, the most important way of achieving this is to protect the rights of women and girls just because it's the right thing to do. It's the human thing to do. And I think that the loud voices that are coming out of women's rights movements continue to actually show that recognition of the progress of girls and women and women will drive the progress. And it's not just the, uh, what they bring to, to the table in terms of resources, but what they bring as people. Now, it's also a good opportunity because the voices that are coming out of women are voices very often of poor people because when we look at poverty, which frames the Millennium Development Goals, we do actually understand that most of the poor are usually women. The image we often use is say, poverty has the face of a woman. And so the vulnerabilities that come from any sector that is mentioned in the development goals, such as, for example, um, the vulnerabilities that come out of uh, uh, climate shocks or natural disasters that destroy the assets and livelihoods of people or bring about waterborne diseases and pests or when natural disasters that bring about floods and droughts and in the end, end up in reducing the food that is available to the people, etc. Women experience this. And so including women really is what is going to make sure that any of these 17 
development goals are fulfilled. Um, so at the Global Fund, we celebrate these development goals for many reasons. One is the fact that they create a global collaboration that everywhere where we work and everywhere where the women's movement that we care for is located, we'll use this framework to interpret their work and so it will bring much more unity of purpose. That is really important for us at the Global Fund. And you know, our promise to the communities that we work with is really clear. We get money and attention where it will make the biggest difference in the fight for gender equality. And that place for us begins by our commitment ever so from the beginning to be attached to women's groups at the grassroots level. And the women's groups at the grassroots level because we believe their commitment to change, their rootedness in cultures, in political systems, their rootedness in actually organizing their own communities real is what sustainability is about. So we are committed as the Global Fund that we will continue to be a strong grant maker to these groups and a strong advocate with them amplifying their voices wherever they are. And as a part of the sustainable development goal, our work will help us to collect data so that we can continue to have good data, as well as expand partnership with women's, women activists, with men, with businesses, with governments, in terms of our advocacy work, so that we see where the change is. We come to this work with a history, and we come to this work with a niche. So our history is that we are connected and have invested for nearly 30 years to more than 5,000 groups in 175 countries. And these groups have impacted the world. They have helped to end wars. You probably know the story in Liberia, where the women of Liberia helped to end war, and not only end the war, but helped to even bring a first elected woman president in that country. We've seen the groups that we've supported in Burma help to bring changes in those places. We've seen groups that have helped to secure new laws in their own countries. 21 countries that we supported developed new laws to prevent violence against women. And so our work in resource mobilization is actually to work together with other women's groups, with other women's funds, to make sure that this whole sector of protecting women's rights is well infiltrated with resources. It's really important for us that these resources that are circulating and making changes for women wherever they are. So we use resource mobilization as one of the tools to increase dedicated funding to women and girls as the global fund. It's an important part that we play. And we also use getting the resources that come through the global fund and specifically go to those groups that have got probably least visibility to large donors but are more visible to us and other women's funds. For example, in the year that is gone, the physical year 2014, we were able to fund in 82 countries. And with the nearly $7 million, we made nearly 500 grants to groups, 500 grants to groups in 82 countries <coughs> whose data we will continue to, 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 to gather and support the global data available on the kind of impact that these groups are able to, 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 to bring 
to, to global to bring to the global change as we are committed to fund in three areas making sure that women have a presence and a participation in the economic and in the political arenas making sure that there is continued movement on working to obtain zero violence on women in the world violence against women is one issue that we cannot even relax about. It's very urgent. And making sure that sexual and reproductive health and rights are available to women wherever they are. These three areas we found very important. In the previous year, we were able to actually reach nearly a million women, nearly 200 girls, and nearly be able, nearly seven thousand also trans people, which is really important for our work, that we are able to be inclusive of, of um, um, different groups that make a difference to the lives of women. When we fund grassroots women, it means that we fund locally based groups. Many of them are women-led, but do include other genders. They have a mission to empower and advance women's rights. They are trusted within their communities. They are strategic. They are usually culturally ground, grounded. They, they are experienced in navigating what change looks like in their own context. And they work in very multifaceted issues. These groups are also cost efficient so that the grants that we give them are able to reach far and wide, much more than what a similar amount of money would do in another situation. So how then, then do they make change? How do we make change happen? First of all, first of all is by the belief in a vision that every woman, every girl is, a, is strong, safe, powerful, with no exception. This vision guides us. And when we say no exception, it means we really take serious the universality of women's human rights. And wherever they exist, we care. We care in different ways. We care in being loud to advocate for those rights. And we care in being able to provide grants to the, in the countries in which we work, to the people that are working step by step, one woman at a time, one girl at a time, small grants that help them to organize as communities, as movements to end, to end uh, to, or to bring to end violence or to ensure that women have sexual reproductive health and rights and are economically and politically empowered. So when we find we expect the outcomes. One, it's really important for us that the, the groups we fund are, are working to increase awareness and agency within their own communities. Last year, a World Bank report emphasized the things that we've said also as women's movement for a long time. Agency is important. When a woman has her voice, when she can be able to claim her rights, then she will be able to participate, to bring change to herself and her, commun and her community as well. We want women to be aware that change comes when there is also change that is extended to the community in which she lives. So it's really important for that change to be practiced and the mindset of the people of that community to become part of wanting to bring the transformation that will be sustained for a long time. It's really important for us that women are also working to see that there's increased resources and access to those resources and that women are taking their own power and using their resources also and the resources in their communities to sustain that change. It's really important for us that women are also working and we are tracking that they are working on policies 
and practices and regulations so that these will be used as the governing principles for not only organizing but for claiming the rights. So when we look at these four quadraniums, what in the end we see as becoming the impact that we've seen in millions and millions of groups that we've, we've uh, of, of, of women all over the world is that they gain equality. They gain equality when they are able to look at these issues. They claim for their own equality when they are able to look at these issues in a different way. We want this equality to be experienced through changing of social norms, cultural norms, through having right laws in the countries, and through economic means that continue to support what is important to shift the gender norms beyond just the areas of, of work, but really what is important to create integrity and to create lasting change in the groups that we fund or lasting change in the communities that we fund, uh, lasting changes in the world that we fund. We are committed as the Global Fund to continue to use um, uh, our networks of uh, women leaders, our networks of advisors, our networks of uh, uh, movements that we have supported for a long time to increase uh, and, and, and scale up change in the communities where we work. And we know that you can be able to support this in the way that you've done years that the Global Fund has been in existence. We want you to stay connected. We want you to become advocates together with us for women to have voice. We want you to, have, to become advocates with us on the issues that make movements of women become stronger. And movements become stronger because research has shown that movements are one of the most important mechanisms to create and sustain long-term social transformation. So we fund movements because we know that social movements are important for keeping policies in place, adapting them and keeping them in place. And we know that they are also important in changing the political process so that it includes people that are marginalized. And we know that they are also important actually in ensuring that once gender norms have been changed, that they are supported also. As a founder, we want to see this movement strong at the base. We want to see strong leadership in the movements, intergenerational leadership is important for us. Hence, some of the work that we support <coughs> in the future is really geared to building the leadership of young women. We want to see these movements also with strong alliances with other movements that are not are beyond women's movements. So connecting to movements of other human rights is really important for us that they are connected to movements that are working on environment, on climate change, etc., so that these movements can do collaborative work. Sustainable development is about collaborative work, and they are using different strategies to achieve their ends. This is what we are about, funding and helping to sustain these movements so that the change as spelled out by the sustainable development goals and us is part of our vision will really become well ingrained and longer, longer lasting and that there will always be people who ensure that what has been achieved is not lost again. So with this I want to thank you and to open up for discussions and questions. Thank you, Ms. Simbi. For those of you who are on the webinar, I invite you to type in your questions before we go to open the phones. If you have a message or a question for Ms. Simbi to answer, please take a moment now to type that into the chat window. I 
Okay, we have a question from Eva. Eva, we're going to unmute you right now so that you can ask that question. Hi, thank you. This is Eva Kolodner. I am on Global Fund staff, but I'm so interested in this conversation, so I'm glad we hosted this today, and I hope it's informative for everyone on the call. My question for you, Ms. Simbi, oh, I'm kind of echoing. Is that okay? Um, my question is whether you feel that the the long kind of laundry list quality to how, how many goals there are now versus the five goals provides some opportunities or whether you feel like it's kind of limiting to working across movements. For example, the women's rights you know movement community working um, in cooperation with the environmental justice community. They might end up being rather um, siloed between those two goals, but I suppose there may be opportunities as well to be more explicit about collaboration and wonder if you can speak about how that that choice of structure may aid or or provide obstacles to movements work together to accomplish um, these goals. Thank you. Thank you for the question and I'll be brief on it. Um, movements, movement building is about uh, creating opportunities for people to, to know how to organize effectively and to know how to be able to take a course and keep that course um, uh, targeted towards the kind of outcome that they want to do. And um, while we can organize ourselves on various movements, the strategies very often are very similar. And so when people are working at local level, level and they are able to learn from each other, they realize that it takes different types of movement, each one of them using different strategies that they have established for themselves to create actually the change. When you want to work on a law about something, it takes many different angles to be able to get to that law. So in one way, yes, it's more work to do collaborative work, yet in another way, it's that collaboration that actually helps to, to be sustainable. Sustainability is about collaboration. Sustainability is about long-term sustainability. is about using resources wisely. And certain collaborations really are able to bring, uh, to, to, to use the resources that are available, whether it's in people, in knowledge, in money, in a better way, way and leverage each other's uh, opportunities really very well. And that's, I think that collaboration is something that, uh, is, 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 the, is the existence of the future depends on collaborations and across many different sectors. Thank you, Ms. Simbi. I believe we have an opportunity for those of you who are on the phone to participate. If you've muted yourself using star six, again, use star six to unmute and the lines will be open. Hello. Can you hear me, Chandra? Hi, Maria. Yes. What's your question? Hi. Hi. This is Maria Nunez. Um, I I wanted to ask a, um, a question relating to the 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 timing of the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, they are. It's really wonderful, and they definitely present an opportunity. They are. They have been adopted at a time when we are also seeing a fair bit of backlash. Um, and and threat to some of the gains that the women's movement have have made, and I'm I'm wondering how uh, Musimbi, you see that governments will be held accountable because it's one thing to stand up when there is a lot of people um, lifting their hand, but another is that when they go back, how will these governments be held accountable to these sustainable development goals, and how will the adoption of the goals practically impact the groups that we support? How will that trickle? How do you expect things will trickle down in practice to the groups that we support? Thank you, Maria. Uh, that's a really good question. Now, we can only use examples, or I can show from the examples of, of what has happened before when there have been mutually acceptable, acceptable protocols at the level of the United Nations. One, it's empowering that people, just governments and other people have opportunity to talk to, to each other. I am sure myself that if we didn't have the mechanism of the United Nations, we would create one. 
because when people talk to each other and even come to an agreement, such a big agreement, such as the Sustainable Development Goal or take any of the goals of the 17, etc., the fact that they have been debated by various people means that when they, those people go back to their own countries, they have to have some ways, even if they don't take, nobody's a, uh, expected to take all of the 17 goals, but they will be able to incorporate some of those goals into their protocols because their relationship with the rest of the world depends on, on that. So, for example, countries which have got bilateral funding from other governments, which is quite a common thing, will be held ac uh, accountable to these goals because the governments that are giving the funding will say, we want to fund you in this area very often on the agreed protocols at the United Nations. In the last Millennium Development Goals, there was a lot of investment, for example, in education and services to education. And the governments had to be able to put their acceptance of those um, uh, OCC aid through those Millennium Development Goals. So that's one area of accountability. Another area of accountability is that in national laws, these, these sustainable development goals did not drop from the sky. They came from what was happening in countries. So these issues are close to the countries from which where actually it, it bites hardest. For example, I was there in one discussion on small island states. And the small island states were real interested that there was a goal that would look at the areas of what happens when there is uh, um, um, uh, natural disasters uh, on the island states. And they will actually hold themselves accountable because this is really important for them. And for us, for women, we will continue to hold the whole world accountable because this is really important for us that we participate in those 17 goals but the, the gender equality goal will hold it close to our heart. So how is, how is that going to happen then in the accountability? One, the UN has a mechanism where during the General Assembly and then various other meetings, countries have to report. And they report by providing the evidence of what they are doing on the things that they are being followed upon. So that reporting, even though there is not a direct punishment. It's very important for the countries because it keeps them in good place with their peers. So that's a, um, already a mechanism of accountability. The second one is that peoples of the nationals of countries that have signed into it take it as their responsibility to claim what has been agreed on, especially when it affects them directly. So civil society is really usually very, very strong in holding governments accountable, even as it participates also in being part of the implementers. So I believe that's another area. And then the last one, which I, I would have put first, is the financing. The Millennium Development Goals did not succeed because there wasn't enough financing that was commensurate with the issues that were mentioned. During the discussion of the Sustainable Development Goal, they were discussed alongside financing. So I could not tell you that people um, were able to actually come out with clarity about how they will finance each one of these uh, Millennium Development Goals, but they indeed came up with newer methods that had not been looked at before. So for example, taxes they discussed taxing quite a lot, and every country has taxes. And they try to see how monies that are received through taxing can become part of the Millennium Development Goals. In Africa, for example, when taxing was looked at how the businesses operate in Africa without paying taxes, in fact, a report was released by Britain at the financing conference that took out in, uh, uh, that took place in, in, in Addis Ababa last year that actually showed that if the businesses paid their taxes in Africa, not only would it be able to 
sustain the financing for the sustainable development goals, but for most of the things that are needed on the, on, on the continent. Um, this uh, report of financing um, through taxes too was, uh, has been really very, very um, much de uh, developed. And then there are other areas too. It's, it's not only aid is financing, but it's also other things that our, uh, countries have discussed, uh, discussed about. So there are accountability mechanisms that are going to be there at many different levels. And I believe that this is what is going to make them not look like they are a utopia, but some of them actually will be fulfilled in a good way. The lines are open. If anyone else has a question for Ms. Simvi, you can also use the chat window in your webinar browser, and we invite you to participate in the remaining minutes of the call. We just have a few moments left. Hi, this is Katie. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Katie, go ahead. I just wondered um, how you felt uh, this process and sort of the results and these new sustainability goals, how, how UN Women stands in all that in relation to the rest of the UN uh, in terms of strength and um, mandate, really, from the rest of the UN, and um, it's specifically uh, thinking of the finances and, and the fact that there was a perceived lack of finances before. Yes, yes. Thank you for that question. And I am on the advisory committee of the UN Women, so I have a lot of uh, inside information about the UN Women and its financing as well. Um, I do believe that the UN Women was quite aware from the beginning that it was going to be on a hard rock to do the financing and has developed a number of mechanisms. And when these goals were actually launched, UN Women themselves convened a number of uh, forums, including governments and other people, and uh, created opportunity for them to be able to pledge on financing the UN women by itself. And then the UN women has also developed other means of mechanism of getting finances for itself, but also has um, a strong um, uh, and growing portfolio to support some of the uh, women's movements. In, in, in small uh, uh, financing on gender equality. So I do believe that because there was an opportunity for many, many governments to make a commitment that they would actually fund the new women, we are not at the same place we were before the Millennium Development Goals, although I cannot say that the UN Women has completely gotten out to be at the level of other agencies, but I think that we are on, 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 on track um, as, a, um, as a, an agency for women of really creating strong argument for financing UN Women really well. Um, UN Women has also, uh, has also been quite outspoken in, in, in saying that they would not sit and wait for that financing to come. So they are going uh, to various groups and asking for financing directly. Thank you, Ms. Sandy. Yeah, and I just want to be able to say in that thing, in this, to achieve the targets for um, sustainable development goals requires really new approaches to, to, to fundraising, to financing, to problem solving. It really requires innovative ideas that we may not have used before. And it's um, sending many of us, including the Global Fund, to ask new questions, to ask um, how do we really exist and meet these big goals and sustain strong funding for women's movements um, without falling off the cliff? And I, I did want to say that it's not really easy because we have seen those of us that fund the women activists who are using a women's human rights framework, that funding for these groups is still scarce. It's still very, very scarce. So as women's funds, for example, we are trying to work together to, to be a strong voice for the women's human rights movements wherever they are and to ensure that governments and others are thinking of funding the women's human rights groups also directly, not only as recipients of uh, what falls off the mechanisms, 
with the results right now show that it's easier to get money for services which are important such as uh, education or even family planning than it is to get money for rights. So this is an area that I, I just want to put there that is really important. There are women's organizations that had really done well, had been funded by the Global Fund before and had grown, but today they are coming back to women's funds and to organizations like ourselves to ask for money. And if you follow research that is done by AWID on behalf of the women's movement, you will really see that uh, there are many, many women's groups that do not have the funding they need to do their work. We have time just for one more question. Go ahead. Uh, this is Katie again. I, I think it's interesting because I think Musimbi, you and I have talked about this. I, I believe that's true domestically as well. It's easier, to, it's easier to raise money for services, for service provision, than it is for policy change and substantive change. Anyway. Yes, that is true. So our work is not done with all of you who are on the call. Our work is only magnified, but our work is better because we are working in an, in an environment that is not any longer afraid to point out the significance that women and girls play. And so we, this is an opportune moment. It's really a good time to be working on women's human rights. And I just uh, hope that we all can hold hands and really keep strong because we, we provide we provide a framework, we provide a mirror that is, would be absent if we, do not, um, if we were not there uh, funding these grassroots women leaders and their organizations to bring change to communities. Sandra, uh, yeah. this ahead. is Maria again. Um, so I know we're in the last few minutes. Uh, this is Maria Nunez, one of the chairs of the Development Committee of Global Funds for Women. And I just want to take the opportunity to welcome everybody again to the call. Um, it, it is, as Chandra said, our inaugural call, but our plan really is to continue this conversation. We are in really challenging times, but very exciting times, and our, our hope is to really engage our donors and our allies and our partners and everybody in these conversations so that we can hear from everybody as well and begin to think about how we approach uh, some of these challenges, and, and we have very ambitious goals, and we look forward to sharing those in, in future calls. So again, thank you again. I would encourage everybody to share uh, the call that's been recorded, but also to invite friends and others, whether they are currently connected to Global Fund for Women or not, to participate in our calls. Let us know if there's any topics that you want to hear. And um, again, uh, we'll see, we'll hear everybody again in February. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Ms. Sim B. And thank you all for joining us today. In the last couple of minutes, I do want to let you know that at the end of the day, you will be receiving an email from Ms. Sim B that gives you an opportunity to share more of the Voices of Equality monthly upcoming calls with your friends and your networks. And finally, of course, we need you to continue to be part of the change that we all want to see to invest your time, treasure, and talent, as it's said, in doing the work of gender equality. Thank you all for all of the many different ways in which you make a difference. Thank you for participating in this inaugural call. And as Maria mentioned, we will look forward to seeing you next month when we are able to bring together our program officer for the Middle East and North Africa region and our vice president of programs to talk about the refugee crisis and our strategy for gender equality in MENA. Thank you, everyone, and I hope you have a great afternoon. <laughs>